we're going to get started here and talk a little bit about uh, the hard part story. I, I, I know a few of you guys may have been to see us before, and I tell you what, I can talk tractors all day long. And my wife, Regina, that we've been married 42 years, and she knows me pretty well. And she always reminds me when I have a visitor to come to the barn to ask the visitor if they want the whole story or half the story. Because I can give them the whole story uh, pretty easily. So we prepared this uh, to be the whole story about the Hart Par 40 tractor. So we're uh, excited about that. So it, it really kind of started out, I, I saw this uh, photo uh, kind of surfing the internet one time and it uh, kind of caught my eye because it said it was at the Texas State Fair. And it's uh, a display that the Hart Park Company uh, put up at the State Fair of Texas, probably about 1912, probably by the vintage of these tractors. And we already had a couple of these Hart Pars and I thought, man, wouldn't that be fun to go in and do that? And uh, so that kind of got the uh, seed planted and it kind of got us rolling as to uh, why we did this. And so we kind of set this out. As I told you earlier, JT's the fourth generation Hart Par owner. Well, the first generation was my grandpa, uh, Louis Ewing Bice. I was named after him. And he bought our first Hart Par in 1930. So I tell people that we've been collecting Hart Pars for, uh, since 1930. Uh, that's how far back it goes. But the other thing is, the older you get, the more selective you kind of are on projects, especially a big project like this. And so uh, we, we decided that we were going to start a conversation and dialogue with, uh, with Dan Christ, who had bought this tractor, and we'll get into a little more detail about that. Um, we believe it to be a 1912. We came up with the serial number on it of 4721, and just uh, full transparency, we never found a serial number anywhere on the tractor, and how we came up with that number is the 47 uh, series was the series that were built during that time frame, and we finished it in 21, so we came up with 4721. <laughs> so that's how we got there. Uh, <laughs> But it is a popular brand, and like I said, we got a lot of legacy with the Hart Par brand, and so that was one of the reasons that it was an attraction to us. Uh, we believe that there's only three of these that are in existence. Um, we'll give you a lot more detail about the uh, other two because we uh, crawled and, and took a, a bazillion pictures of those things. Uh, one of them is at the Western Development Museum up in uh, Saskatoon, Canada. Shout out for Kelly in the back there for Canada. And they were very gracious letting us go in and uh, take all of our measurements and do some scanning, which JT's gonna cover here in a bit. Um, so that, that's uh, kind of the background. We uh, had a lot of fun doing this, and uh, we just encourage people when you start out on a project like this to make sure you have fun. A um, little bit on the history. These are some pictures of the tractor. Uh, when it was in the uh, field working, that top left-hand picture uh, is a tractor that, or is the very tractor in uh, operation. You could see a belt there. I don't know exactly what they were using it for, probably to thrash wheat, uh, right outside of Hayes, Kansas. That next picture uh, was Carl Krause, and he uh, was sitting on the, uh, the front wheel of the Hart Par, and uh, I got to meet his youngest son, who is the fellow in the third picture down here, Harold Krause. That's a picture of he and his wife, Virginia. Harold uh, is, is just deceased uh, in, uh, I guess, the year before last. This picture was taken in 2019. And I called him up because I was in that area, and I said, I was trying to tell him about, uh, hey, uh, we think we might have uh, a, a family, you know, tractor of your your family and he goes well who is this again I told him again he says hang on let me get my hearing aids so <laughs> he put his hearing aids in and then he, I said hey I think I'd just like to come out there and visit with you and your wife if you got a few minutes and he goes yeah come on out so he gave me directions I went out there ended up eating supper with him but he gave me the picture that you see there in the center of uh, his dad sitting on the front wheel of that heart park so uh, Harold and Virginia were very sweet people and took us in and we were excited to be able to meet them. But, so uh, I know Dan is, is here today and for those of you that don't know him, I'd really encourage you to get to know him because he's a wealth of information, not only about hard parts, but all kind of prairie tractors and everything. 
Um, and he uh, uh, was very gracious to give us the opportunity to be the caretakers of this thing. Um, and I, I'm be forever grateful to you, Dan, for allowing us with, to have that opportunity. But this is the condition of the tractor when he got it. He, he tells a story about helping uh, Mr. Carl Kraus helped him push that grain bin off of there. And that's really what saved the tractor from the scrap drives probably during World War II, is the fact that they had some utility uh, using it to uh, store wheat and haul it from field to field to, to plant their wheat fields out of, outside of Hayes, Kansas. So um, this is uh, the condition of the project and the condition of Dan in 2017. <laughs> He's still, look, he's, he's still looking good. So, Dan, stand up for us for just a minute because I, I, I'd like to everybody to put a face with a name. Now, go ahead and stand up, please. <laughs> I, I'll be uh, forever grateful to you, Dan. I bought it when he was 16. I bought it when he was 16. Yeah, well, I, I had to make sure that I had the date right. Uh, because it was 1969 when he, uh, when he bought the tractor. And he did a lot of work, he gathered a lot of parts. Uh, so it wasn't uh, just a bare chassis like you saw earlier in those pictures because he'd made a lot of patterns, patterns that we used. Um, it, pulling uh, this, this tractor out of the, the river in South Dakota, I believe, wasn't it, Dan? Uh, so that was a pattern that was used for a lot of the wood patterns that were made. Uh, to help us get to where we were. And this is the cylinder pattern down here on the bottom. <clears throat> yeah, and, and KR was pointing out that we did use the crankshaft out of this river tractor that's in the tractor that you'll be seeing running here in a little bit. So anyway, that's just kind of the, uh, the, the broad brush background. I just really encourage anybody that uh, is in the Central Texas area, if you've got time, we're 90 miles south of Dallas, we'd love to have you come down and uh, just give us a ring and we'll take you out to the, to the barn and talk old iron with you. So I'm a, at, the, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to JT and let him talk uh, about a lot of the planning that went into this as well as scanning. He's uh, an expert when it comes to 3D printing and uh, KR and JT have a lot of chemistry and they work well together. So I'm gonna turn it over to them, thank you. All right, so uh, yeah, we've got this kind of split up. So. Uh, Dad and KR and I are just going to take turns. Um, so first off, we're just we're just going to go through exactly what we did to make this thing work. Um, and this was the planning phase, right? Um, I, we spent about four years on the project. Two of it was planning and research, and then uh, another two years of actually making parts and uh, putting the thing together. So uh, we took trips to Quinter, Kansas, to go see Dan several times. We went to Wapello. Iowa, uh, Lyle Spitznagel, who uh, is restoring a, a, the 30 horsepower version of this tractor. Um, obviously, Crosby uh, went up to see John's. John uh, Tissy has a, a 30 horse version of this tractor. Uh, they share about half of the parts-ish. I don't think we ever really got that number, uh, but they share uh, a lot of the same part numbers. Um, even though they're really different tractors. Um, and then uh, we also went to Charles City, Iowa. Um, that's uh, uh, the uh, shoot, what's that? Floyd County, thank you. Floyd County uh, Historical Society. They have a museum up there. You know, for those that don't know, that's where Hart Park was. Uh, uh, they did most of their building out of uh, uh, Floyd, Floyd County in Charles City. Uh, that was not actually named after the Charles's. Uh, heart and par. Um, but regardless, uh, we went there a couple of times. We took a bunch of pictures there. Uh, Don Sell actually rebuilt uh, that 40 horse and uh, John Tissy's 30 horse. And uh, John ended up with the 30. The 40 Don kept uh, until his death uh, sometime in the 90s, auctioned it off and uh, ended up at the museum. And then we also took two trips to uh, Saskatoon to, to WDM. Uh, where the, the best example of the, the tractor uh, of that model existed. <clears throat> so, you know, the things that we did as far as planning goes, uh, coming up with the timeline, uh, being able, I mean, the timeline is definitely going to be wrong, but it's good to have one, right? Uh, things are going to go wrong, you're going to run into hiccups, and, 
you're just going to have to adjust along the way. But it's good to have a goal. Uh, we found that uh, it was good for us to have a goal. Our goal was, you know, buy a particular tractor show that this thing needed to be done, uh, kept a fire lit under us, uh, and, and kept us going. Um, and then we would take, uh, there was about six trips, I think, probably, that KR came down to Texas. And we would, I don't know anybody who's familiar with the EOS model, but what we would do is split the work up and the things that we could do on our own, we would go ahead and do. And then we would schedule these basically sprints where KR would come to town, we'd have friends that would take off work and we'd just work straight on it for four or five days and get a lot of headway done and also generate the list for the next trip, right? So we'd generate the list, we'd split up the work, we'd do all the little stuff, and then we'd come back together in like four, you know, three or four months later and uh, get a lot of it knocked out. Helps to have vision. Uh, without vision, you don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of fire to, uh, to get it done. Um, parts book. So we were fortunate enough that there was a parts book that existed. Um, we got a copy of it. The, it could not be scanned and uh, OCR'd uh, to be searchable. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. So I actually hired a, a lady out of Pakistan, I think, on Fiverr, Fiverr.com. It was very inexpensive. It cost like $30 to have this lady go through every part in the entire parts book and transcribe it into an Excel spreadsheet to make it searchable for us. It's about $80 now. <laughs> I, I get a lot of them done, it's about 80, but it's still cheap. Yep. So online marketplaces like that are very valuable. It was, and, it, and the reason it helped us was just making all the parts searchable so that we could organize them because it had both the 30 and 40 horsepower versions all in the same parts book. So in 2017, uh, we went up to Saskatoon and we met the staff there. They were extremely gracious and extremely welcoming. Uh, we couldn't take anything on the tractor apart, so that was a limitation for us. Uh, this was a, a valuable part of their collection uh, that they're never gonna run it again. Um, it will just always stay as a static display, more than likely. Um, so we met them in 2017, familiarized ourselves with their process. Uh, we took a lot of tape measure measurements. KR and I, we had with our rulers, just started modeling. We had two laptops and a folding table, and we started modeling the tractor live and uh, realized that that wasn't gonna get us very far. <laughs> so uh, in 2019, we took another trip back um, and we had uh, rented a, uh, a company in Canada, actually met us there and brought a 3D scanner and we went in and scanned a lot of the tractor, almost the whole thing. Um, so in that first trip, however, we took a ton of pictures. There's a lot that you can do with pictures, especially if you're taking them with scale. So you take a little ruler, take a picture, we can trace it in 3D software for simple parts and just recreate it from a picture. You don't, don't even have to scan it or measure it, uh, which is really nice. But we took a lot of photos. Um, we have somewhere around 7,000 photos of the, the tractor in Saskatoon, the tractor in Iowa, and then also uh, the parts that we created just along the way. <clears throat> we used uh, online um, cloud service. You can use Google Photos. You can use SmugMug. We created a lot of different directories. Uh, we had directories for research, scanning, design, modeling, 3D printing, casting, machining, and assembly. And so they were all organized where we could go in and look at those. This is a representation of the 4,200-ish pictures that we took in Saskatoon of the tractor. So I think we covered almost all of it. There's still <laughs> corners we don't have. There's absolutely right side wheel we have one photo of the right side wheel because it's also it's only it's parked this far from another tractor yeah so. that was inconvenient so um i told you that we wasted a lot of time modeling live and uh we decided to go to the scanning route so why did we go to the scanning route well um uh, it's fast and it's accurate and it makes kr's job a whole lot easier um, so we were able to bring in a scanner that has an accuracy. You can get scanners between nine and 35 thousandths, depending on how much you want to pay. Uh, the one that we used was somewhere between nine and 14 thousandths resolution. Um, so we were able to go in and get a, a really good representation of a lot of the parts. Um, you could tell like the gaps that are missing or is because something was in the way. 
So as scanning technology gets better and better, the scanners are gonna get smaller and we're gonna be able to get them around the corners and behind stuff. Right now, the scanners are just too big and we gotta come up with the missing dimensions another way. Um, oh, and the other thing, scanning is becoming so ubiquitous now, you can even do it with your smartphone. So if you have an iPhone or an Android phone, you can take pictures all the way around a part. As long as the resolution you don't really care about too much, it's pretty accurate. There's just some more images from uh, the, the raw data that we gathered from the scanning process. Let me talk for a second. So, so we went up there and I had an expectation to do about, we, had, we, had, we hired them for one day, eight hours or, or a little more, and I had an expectation of doing about 10 parts. We know we needed the flywheel, we wanted to get the carburetor, the intake, and whatever else we could get. I mean, I had 10, 10 or 12 parts that I knew I really, really wanted. And then an hour into it, we were like, wow, we're gonna get a lot more. So we learned how, you have to use the targets. Go to the next slide. Yeah, I'll talk about it. Yeah, so we, uh, the, there's a few different types of scanning. The one that we did here was a targeted system uh, where we actually place targets on the part that we're scanning. So that's what these little dots are. These are magnetic reflectors, okay? So as long as the scanning gun can see one of these and it had already scanned it in the past, it knows exactly where it's at and is able to keep track of uh, its positioning extremely, extremely accurately. Um, so then it was just our job to move the magnets around, uh, which is a little bit tedious. Uh, the other type of scanner, you actually have readers that stands on a tripod behind you, and it will track the position of the scanner so that you don't have to mess with the targeting dots. The nice thing about the targeting dots is that the scanner is smaller and you can get it in, in, in tighter places. Uh, we actually have a video here of um, some scanning that we did. Uh, this was uh, scanning of the flywheel. So the flywheel is extremely complicated because the spokes of the flywheel are actually uh, kind of at an angle and it's, it's really awkward. Um, so the flywheel itself is closer to the engine but the hub is, sticks out and uh, would have made for uh, drawing it manually very difficult. So you can see the, about the size of the gun. It's got lights on it to kind of alert him when he's away from a dot that he had already tracked and that he needed to come back some. And then it just, you know, it just starts showing up on the laptop, lettering and everything. What's the size of the file that resulted? That's a great question. So there's different resolutions that you can, that you can select. Um, we were taking uh, somewhere around a million uh, readings per minute. Uh, resulted in, uh, for the whole tractor, about 12, te uh, 12 gigabytes worth of data. Yeah, it's not bad, and it's gotten better. They're, the files are smaller now. But regardless, the, it would have been extremely challenging to draw that thing without scanning. All right, so same deal with the, uh, with the oil pan. Uh, the oil pan was gigantic on this thing, and it's, it's cast iron. Um, so we, uh, we scanned that as well, and you'll notice on here that uh, there is uh, the original crankcase that uh, got blown out. Uh, the, I don't know if y'all know anything about 40 heart bars, but uh, they didn't have force feed lubrication. Uh, they used the exhaust down in the oil plant pan, uh, just a little pipe that came off of the, uh, the exhaust manifold down into the oil pan, it had a bunch of, had a 90 degree elbow and a bunch of holes drilled in it. And so the exhaust would just blow the, the oil up into the engine. And so all of, all of the 40s, all, all both of them uh, have <laughs> oil pans or crankcases that uh, are blown out likely from a stuck piston. Throwing a rod. Yeah, throwing a, throwing a rod. Is that laser scanning? Uh, Partly, it's using reflect, reflective light, and then that scanner has a single line laser to get deep in there. It, it, it uses both. So that, that casting's uh, three foot by two foot by eight, I don't know, 24 inches deep. It's, it's a big casting. We were very lucky. We scanned it, I drew it, modeled it, created a drawing, 
and then one of Leroy's buddies out in Pennsylvania, he was, he was very, very a super talented, real wood pattern maker, and he made the pattern for that because you get into this and the sand printed mold, that mold would have been really expensive, and there, there's a balance act on that, so we'll get into that in a minute, but he, um, Leroy's buddy made that pattern. <clears throat> So I want to talk about why you would model a tractor in its entirety. So in, in this image here, we did not have 90% of what's in that image. We had the frame rails, we had the first reduction gear, we had the transmission shaft, had no engine. Crankshaft. We had a crankshaft, had a crankcase that Dan, Dan had built a pattern for 25 years ago. <clears throat> and we had a cylinder pattern that Dan had made. So, Everything else we didn't have, no intakes, no carburetor. We had, a, we had the cooling tower, but we didn't know where it needed to sit. We had no exhaust pipes. So why would, why would you model the whole thing? You gotta make sure everything fits together. That reduces time and, and money in the end. <clears throat> so you can do it right in the computer. You can check interference. You can make sure the bolt hole sizes are all okay. Um, and a lot of parts, we had some transmission shifting parts that we had to match new parts to old parts. So we designed, we designed the new part to match the old part. So we, we did some integral, integral testing between originals and, and new parts. Uh, in the end, it does save time in testing and fitting because if it fits on the computer, I mean, this is a kind of a general engineering term. If it fits on the computer, it should fit in real life. It doesn't always work that way, but uh, <clears throat> you can read, then you create drawings for if you're going to sub parts out to machine shops. Um, one of the cons is it's it's pretty expensive. There's there's no doubt it is coming down with scan data. It and I've become more efficient at it. So and it's very time consuming with no tangible um, product in the end, or no tangible product to, to, that you can hold. You can't hold a casting. You can't hold the model. It's all inside the computer, so it's kind of it's kind of hard to hard to pay a, up to a third of the original or the cost of the project in the engineering, but it, it does pay off in the end. That's why we model the whole tractor in its entirety. Um, I probably had more than one t telephone conversation with KAR because we didn't have anything tangible, and we'd spent about a third of the budget, and but at the end. I, I felt like it really paid off because we had very little modification that needed to be made to anything at the end. So we, um, we were we were standing at Crosby, North Dakota, at the show, and there was a real serious discussion. It was because it was getting kind of scary. But then, within a month or two, we started casting parts, and it was bam, stuff started happening. So this is a it's a viewer out of my software program, but. We can take this model, spin it. I can, but you can section it through anything. You can see inside of it. You can do whatever you like, literally move it around, whatever you, whatever, whatever you want. Make sure stuff fits, and it's kind of just fun to play with. So that kind of just gives you a scope. It's kind of hard with that screen resolution, but you can. It kind of just gives you a scope. That's all the stuff we didn't have. We had to make all of that. I have no. I have no clue what the part number part how many parts it was. But between me, the three of us, we have touched every single part of that tractor. I even went to the extent that I rubbed my hands around every single lug just to say I, could, I touched every single part of that tractor. <laughs> so I, I know you guys were watching the, uh, this is uh, Alex's 3D printer that was up here printing. And although this is a scale version because it would have taken too long to print it large, we actually printed the inspection cover uh, over lunchtime, over, or since this morning, I, I guess it took about three or four hours. This is about half scale, um, and it is, yeah, it's it's that part right there. So y'all can come up and, and uh, mess with it later. That part, that part originally is about it's about that big or so, in its, in its full size. So it's real important, and here's where it got a little tricky. We didn't have a carburetor, and it's a hard part carburetor. So we were, we were very fortunate that we were able to take apart the, 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 uh, the carburetor at John Tessie's in Crosby, but it's different. The 40 carburetor is different than the 30 carburetor, but the floats and the bowls, that and the strainer bowls, that's all the same. So we were able to directly 
copy all that stuff. So I was able to find where the float height is and all, how all the float is held in there. And there was a cutaway in the book. And there was a cutaway in the book, but it didn't scale properly either. So I overlaid it and I did all this and <clears throat> luckily I was able to figure it out because they have a single cylinder heart par and it shares some similar, similar features. And I had just rebuilt that carburetor the summer before. So I was able to, look, to figure that out. But that, that was probably the overall, that was the last big casting we had made because I was a little afraid and I, it's got a Venturi in it. And I'm like, I'm not a carburetor designer. <laughs> so I, I, was able to, I was able to figure it out and we, we persevered and we've got it running pretty well at this point. But here's, here's just another video of the exploded view. It, it's just, I, I get pretty impressed with this because I mean, we didn't have any of that. We didn't have the roof. We didn't have, we had the cooler we, that we rebuilt. We had the cooler top, but here, here we're showing we're, we're, we had, this is for the clutch linkage and reverse linkage because Harpar used a, they called it a shear. You, and it, it grabs a plate and stops a plate and then runs a planetary in reverse. So you, that's how you drive backwards with a heart part. So this is the linkage for running that. So we were, we were nesting original parts with new parts. And that that is that part. So that part we printed twice. We, test, we printed it as a test, which is there and it's all glued together. And then we printed, that's the pattern one. So in this, in this process, we use a, a, a very diverse mixture of how we did parts. We did traditional wood patterns uh, for the bigger components like the flywheel, the crankcase was done, the Dan did years ago. Uh, the underpan was a cat wood pattern, flywheel. One of the belt pulley parts was a, was a wood pattern. And then we did somewhere around 40 wood, wood or plastic printed patterns. 47. 47 plastic printed patterns that they were all kind of approximately a basketball size and smaller. And then we did, I'd have to look at the number, but it was 25 or 30 sand printed molds. Because anything that had a core such as the carburetor or the exhaust pipes or the intake pipes, that all had cores. So you're making two patterns at a minimum. So we, we, did, we opted to do sand printed molds for that stuff. And each part was evaluated whether, what direction we would have gone or what direction to go to, to make a pattern. So here we see the, uh, the I think that's all of the wood or plastic printed patterns. Some of them, the, uh, the big giant lever, there's a steering lever, that part's almost 24 inches long. That's printed in three pieces three or five pieces, I don't remember it was, now. Yeah, it was five, I think, well, because we also cut, we cut some down the half and printed them flat down and then glued them together if they were too big or too complicated. So here, here's just a couple more examples. And then we did a hybrid. I mean, the, the lower cam bearing, it was a hybrid of wood and plastic because, I mean, the, the wood piece is real easy, the plastic, piece was not real easy to you to whittle that out of wood wouldn't have been very fun so you just just print it in plastic and and then glue it to a piece of wood and then you see that's the oil pan pat pattern on the right that that's a serious it's a really neat casting so then these are I don't know half of the the um, the sand printed mold parts this is if you look at this part upside down it's my, it's the happiest part I've ever modeled because it's a smiley <laughs> face that's my favorite part on the entire tractor and it's hidden. So, <clears throat> so I mean, that part, that part probably would have been a $4,000 pattern to make. And we had the part laying on the ground for 1500 bucks. So it, it was a very diverse mix of what we did. And there were, there was plastic parts that I would have done sand printed molds cause it's a little bit, it pulls out of the sand a little better and looks a little bit better there. there I would have done it a little different if I was doing it again. Uh, here, here's an example of a sand printed mold. <clears throat> That's the rocker arm stand. They, there's very little stock on them, so they don't require a lot of machining, which really reduces cost. So some of the advantages are you can design a highly complex part that you can't pull out of the sand. You can make a part way harder than you could design to make out of a, of, out of a pattern. Um, almost anything that I need a core for like where you got a water passage or 
exhaust passage, I get in sand printed mold just because it, it's, it's all printed at once and it, you drop the core in and it's done. Yeah, you can you do re reduce stock and it, there's a time, time frame. It, it's a way quicker turnaround with the sand printed mold. That, that really keeps projects moving when you're not waiting to ship patterns back and forth, the store patterns. Uh, one of the disadvantages is it is expensive. And if you need a more than quantity of one or two, it does get real expensive. But you can, there is, there's a, there's a finite line that you just gotta figure out with whatever part you're doing. Uh, the other problem is if there's a problem with the casting, and there's no pattern. You gotta pay for another pa pay for another mold. But I, like I talked about earlier, I've had two pro two parts out of 500 or 600 600 castings. They're they're actually that's they're molding up. This is at Dakota Foundry. Uh, they're molding up the pattern for the cylinder the first several times. And there was there were some challenges. That Lou's gonna talk about later. <clears throat> One of the things I want to talk about is. Um, using a reputable foundry that knows what they're pouring and when they're gonna pour it. Because there's a lot of mom and, top pop, bleh, mom and pop foundries that don't really work on a schedule. It, it, it's very useful if the foundry's using like an ERP system to keep track of their orders and they, they run it like a business and get parts out to you because if you're trying to keep moving on a project it, and you're waiting on stuff and you don't know and they can't answer, oh, I'm gonna pour it next week, That is a significant, that costs money. And you, you really wanna know what, like a foundry know what they're pouring. There's a lot of problems with foundries that they're melting random stuff and you don't really know the product that you're getting. And that, that can be a problem. And um, I wanna talk about, yeah, there's a lot of problems with hardness and castings and then you're just chewing up machine machinery and it, it doesn't pay off. So, and then I want to, Transport costs, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you start moving patterns around the country, especially with trucking right now, it is expensive. So you really want to think about that and maybe take a whole load to the foundry. Don't, don't send 10 little trucks to the foundry, but send one big load. You, you got to look at each part with an open mind. How can I do this part efficiently? Do you, I have to make five of them? Do I have to make 10 of them? Do I have to make one of them? So there's a lot of CNC shops out there and not all of them are hurting for work, but they can, there's, you can utilize that. <clears throat> if you need more than one part made, you might wanna look into it. There's lots of job shops out there that you might not even know about. They're probably in your town that can pound out complicated geometry that you can't do on a manual machine or it's gonna take a long time. So, and the other thing I wanna talk about is threading. Internal threading, if it's above an inch, your tooling's expensive and it takes a lot of power. So it, it's, they can do that on a CNC machine like no problem. So it, that, it's just something to think about. Large components, that's still, there's still lots of shops out there. Everybody thinks they're closing, but there's still lots of shops out there that do large, large component machining. You want to find one that's reputable, it can turn parts around and treats it like a business. Uh, CNC sheet metal is it that has drastically reduced time in 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 manufacturing. So they can cut cut with water jets, plasma, laser, all sorts of different processes, get that stuff, draw it up, cut it out in flat pattern, and then bend it. It will reduce your time and accuracy they increase accuracy a lot. One comment I want to make on sheet metals, sheet metal I've always felt like is kind of voodoo. And uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to work sheet metal. And uh, with the new modeling software that we have, we're actually able to go in and not only cut the sheet metal, like be a water jet or plasma cutter, but also go in and the same machine make marks with a Sharpie and show us the lines where all the bins need to be so that we don't have to guess. It's, it, it's, it's beautiful. Or they, like, they can laser etch it too and puts, puts the line right on there. So the project scope, to paint or not to paint? You wanna talk this, about this, Lou, real quick? Well, I know that Alex and, and um, uh, they're gonna have a little bit more on that, but yeah, I, 
I say it's the golden rule, and that's what Wendell used to always say when he was working on projects for us. It's the man with the gold rule. So, you know, whoever owns it, uh, it's kind of your decision. But we had enough. Uh, thankfully, uh, I talked to Dan about this. Uh, he came, when he got this thing home back in the early 70s, I guess, he hand painted a lot of that, and it turned out that uh, on the fenders, that protected a lot of the original. Uh, uh, lettering that had the Hart Park Company, Charles City, Iowa there. So uh, it was interesting when we got our fine line guy out there who's down in the far right hand corner. Uh, yeah, if you, if you decide to do this, uh, make sure you get an artist that can help you recreate the uh, original lettering on that. We, you see that picture top right, that's some of the original stenciling that was on the gear guard that we found and uh, you know you don't want to go and paint over that, right? And you know that uh, that 1930, the 1836 Hart Parma, my granddad uh, bought new in 1930. Well, it it had a lot of field repairs on it, and we didn't paint it because I didn't want to cover any of that up because it had a lot of his handiwork on it, you know. So that's the other thing that you have to consider. Um, but anyway, Alex and um, and uh, Chris Hudson are going to talk more about that in detail, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, individually if you've got a, a project that you're trying to decide which way to go on. We've got some of both, but uh, it, it seems like that uh, that original patina, as I've heard some people say, and I think Kurt said this before, you can't replace that, you know, and, and it's so true, but you also have a lot of extra effort that you have to put in, because we had a lot of new parts here, and as you'll see here in a little bit, uh, I kind of challenge you to find them. Uh, <laughs> And, and we, we added a little bit, uh, our, our Kurt and I, were, he, he was talking earlier about he and I belonging to the same wire brush union. Well, you know, I, I added some things to my resume. I, I moved some dots around when they were doing laser work up there, doing the scanning. And uh, I also got a chance to uh, rust a lot of parts <laughs> during this process. So. He also uh, sanded and painted almost single-handedly every part that I printed. So I was I'll printing- I'll to my resume too. Yeah. <laughs> I was printing at the office, I was printing at home, and I was just giving the parts to dad, and dad would go in and just lightly sand them and then print them to smooth them up and, they, and, and glue them together for some of the large ones that came out beautiful. So along the lines of Project Scope, it's, it's real easy to do the easy parts, but in a big project like this, you got to force yourself to do the hard parts also, because I mean, they'll, they'll just never get done. So there's a lot of projects sitting out there that you're, they're missing something big that's gonna cost a bunch of money, but you just have to sit down and think about it, figure it out, and, and do it just, just so the project doesn't sit idle after a while, because then you move on to another project, and then that happens to that project, and it just it becomes cumbersome, and then you're moving parts around. The other thing is to disassemble the project completely. We had every nut and bolt out of that tractor except for that front yoke on the front wheel because we didn't want because it had been leaded in and zinced in that to, for the casting to match the C channel. We didn't want to take that apart, but we still took the front wheel out and you could swing it out of the way, and then you could still still inspect. And we did, uh, luckily we didn't have to change any of those parts. We just took, took it all apart and cleaned it up and and got put it back together. The transmission on this tractor, we had to 100% take apart because it was stuck. Uh, hard part was actually pretty inventive, they, innovative. They used a ball bearing up in these areas. There's one here and one here in 1912. It's got a, a ball bearing that I bought for 30 bucks right off of eBay. <laughs> no, no problem to get it. I mean, ball, since ball bearings and roller bearings have been, have been standard for that long, it was real easy to get them, but we had to take that whole transmission apart, put a lot of, we didn't put any new shafts in it, but we put new pinning gears. We turned this gear off and sleeved it, but it's real important because you don't want that, to, you don't want a problem in that to bite you after the tractor's together. That got, it's got bronze bushings a whole bunch of places. We replaced those everywhere, axle casting and all the whole transmission, and then put it back together. Um, <clears throat> You need to fill your time when you're waiting for a casting or waiting for somebody to machine something to fill that with machine and other little parts. Just just get those out of the way because I, I like to do that when I was waiting on big parts because then that way when the big parts were done, 
I could bolt the thing together and get had some satisfaction out of it and, and it was a confidence builder to get on to the next step. Um, because you don't want to wait, you don't want to have the whole big parts machine and then not be able to bolt the thing together right away. So here, here we see, we put the engine together in my garage in my house in Pendleton, Indiana, which is a little cumbersome, but it, it worked out and we had a great time doing it. And um, it started with a John Deere B in my garage and that was, I have a very loving and helpful wife that puts up with this stuff. So She's never parked in our garage, so I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> so, so I mean, the engine, the engine itself stall, yeah, stands. I don't remember seven. It wouldn't fit out the door, so it's seven foot, seven foot six or so, seven and a half foot with with the governor and the exhaust and the air heater on it and everything. So we built that in Indiana, um, like I, like we talked about earlier. We were, when we were waiting on stuff, I'd do a bunch of machining for the chassis. I'd drive to Texas, spend a week in Texas, and come home and then, then work on the engine. We were waiting on castings on the engine for a long time on a few, few of the components, so that was a little bit of a challenge. But here's the, um, so then right at the end, it was summer of 2021, last summer. In August, the engine was done. We had finished the engine right before Crosby in July. And then um, like two and a half weeks later, we, um, Lou, Lou sent his guy up and picked it up from my, my garage. And then we, we spent a blitz week putting, putting the tractor together in Texas. This is a little bit of a compilation video. I think it's two. Yeah. And all these components we had already pre-made and a lot of them had been test fitted before, but Luckily, I, we saw it earlier, we, we just dropped the engine in with a wrecker and it, luckily everything fit. It's one of those sad. I don't want to in on your presentation, but I, I want you to, this is the most amazing part of this thing to me is they put that tractor together in six inches. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. 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 That's great. That is what planning does. Well, that was about uh, six, probably it explains, six. It explains why I've been stuck in my shop for six years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was probably 72 hours or so uh, during that period of time, but uh, we probably put in about 10,000 hours to get to that 72. So, you know, don't let us fool you too much with that fast forward stuff. But it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch these guys come together and have so much harmony and enjoy what they were doing. We, 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 <laughs> Jake, we, we did have a little bit of interference with some clutch components that we were relying on a few different vendors and it, some stuff just didn't work. And you, JT and I laid under the thing together for like six hours. It was pretty brutal. That was one of the biggest, kind of the biggest hiccups that just, and we ended up resolving it. It just, it, it, was, it was kind of heavy, <laughs> a lot of heavy parts. I don't use social media a lot, but I took a picture of both of them under there and their bellies was showing and I, I, had, to, I had to put down too sexy for my tractor underneath it, so. <laughs> I mean, we, we didn't have the toolbox or anything, so we, we reverse engineered that from the tractor in Canada. Had, Lou had a cabinet maker run it, make it. We actually had that engine running at KR shop to make sure that it was uh, all going to, to uh, operate before we uh, actually set it into the frame of the tractor. That's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> we built that from, from scratch and that, that was, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that one. And if you come to our place, you, you'll see state flags on everything because I have a, a, a tendency to want to know where things spent their working life. So that's got a Kansas flag on it. And these, this is just shouting out all the people that were instrumental in, in putting this together. Leroy's here and Wally, his pattern maker is 
was very, very important. We've got a, a hired hand there that helps us at the, at the shop, and Mike Summers is our artist. John Tissy sold me the extensions he, he had uh, that fit on two of his tractors, but he decided that, to start selling parts, which is what uh, uh, Kurt's been helping him do, and so he sold us the extensions, and we got those on there, and it, it really set the tractor off, in my opinion. So the next thing we, you know, so I think uh, maybe it was Mark that was talking about, you know, all the things that can go wrong. And so we did have a few hiccups. Uh, KR was talking about uh, the cylinder. And uh, we had seven attempts at that puppy before we realized that we had some modifications that needed to be made because we kept having the, one of the core boxes uh, shift on us. And we talked to Dan several times because he had actually poured a set of cylinders for the project at one point in time, um, but we ended up making a trade with Lyle Spitznagel because he had a, they were really 30 cylinders and we were wanting to put this together as a 40, so we decided to go ahead and pour two new cylinders for it. Um, but then Wally kind of bailed us out, uh, the pattern maker up in Pennsylvania that we went and visited, and so he made some adjustments to the pattern. It really helped us out a lot. Um, after we got the thing running, well, it seemed like that, uh, well, I don't know, I guess it was probably when we were trying to do the recreation that we were going to, we'll show you here in a minute, we started noticing some issues with uh, it not running quite properly, and we figured out that the uh, rocker arms were being worn pretty, pretty uh, dramatically, and so we, we figured out that, oh, we, we had to go and recast those and heat treat them so that they would be hard enough, as well as grounding the cam loads was another issue that we figured out wasn't helping us too much. So we got those ground and we got the uh, rocker arms recast and got them heat treated. So that uh, has solved that problem. You'll see here on the picture that this is the original thickness. And so the lobes had actually worn this in. And so we weren't getting, uh, we weren't getting full uh, intake for fuel at all. Yeah. we. <laughs> You know, even Hartpar didn't quite have everything figured out because we went to WDM and did that scanning. We scanned the steering arm, and so we made the steering arm exactly like the one at WDM, and then we went up to Crosby and started looking at John's 30 uh, a little more critically, and we figured out that they had extended the steering arm about, what, six inches? or Three. Yeah, the, the knuckle, knuckle itself. Went from three inches to six inches on the fulcrum, and it... It steers now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could steer it as long as it was on the concrete before. And now we, uh, I think the next slide shows how we, we uh, salvaged the, uh, uh, the pattern that JT had printed. And, you know, we, we had that in three pieces, I think, at that point in time. And then the next slide will show you how we uh, print, reprinted and extended it and then glued it back together, puttied it up and sent it back to the foundry. And so we've got the, uh, the extended steering arm on there. So uh, I, I just have to say though, we've, you know, these guys were very good stewards. Uh, I got a, a real understanding daughter-in-law that uh, put up with JT's uh, 3D printer running uh, through the night sometimes. And KR has been an excellent steward in terms of finding bearings and shafts and gears and all the different things that have made this uh, possible. So uh, it, was, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, and I, I, could, I always thought that, hey, if I ever took on a big project like this, that we probably ought to christen it. So uh, we ended up uh, deciding that that was something that uh, should be worth doing. So uh, click on the bottom, I think, there, and there should be a little video pop up. That's my wife, Regina. We just got the tractor uh, uh, operating, getting ready to go and drive it out of the back of the shop. So we thought, okay, well, they'll, they'll do shifts this way. We'll do a tractor that way. So <laughs> we christened her and then jumped on her and took her out of the shop for the first time. So that was a, that was a great feeling, I, I want to tell you. That spring, that spring on the front wheel works really well, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> for, for whatever reason, it is it doesn't bounce as much anymore and I can't figure that one out but it does not bounce as much. Well it's really all about making memories and we showed you this picture earlier that kind of planted the seed 
And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool since we've got the uh, other two tractors and uh, we had a Satley plow, but found out that it was really a case Satley plow. And Dan had a hard par Satley plow and he was generous enough to sell it to us and we restored it. And so that was what it looked like then. And this is what it looked like now, which was last October at our place. And uh, we got in period dress and that's uh, KR on the uh, single cylinder oil king with the dome hat on, and then JT's on the right uh, front wheel of the Hart Park uh, Old Reliable. That's me next to him, and then my youngest son Ty is there. Uh, Robbie Whitehead that did a lot of the fabrication work and so forth uh, was on the uh, 40 wheel, or clutch, or pulley, I guess. And then Dan was standing uh, there on the far left uh, in the tractor, or in the picture with us, so. Made a lot of good memories and had a lot of fun doing it, so. We spent about two hours making sure that the tractors were lined up in the correct orientation. <laughs> Seriously. Like, it's, it's, a, it's about as close, I think, as you could get it. I'm going to be honest, this is one of the most fun experience. It was all work, but it was one of the most fun experiences I've ever had in my life with, with restoration. It was literally that much fun to, to, to be able to be part of this and be part of the whole process and then culminating with this day. And being with Dan and Lou and everything, it was mind or life changing, it was being part of it. Let's see, this is one of the only places in the world that you can have, have uh, three heart pars like this running at the same time. So it's a five cylinder heart par, which you'd be real screwed with one of them. <laughs> You can do this at Crosby, North Dakota too, but it's not, they're, they're running at different times. Well, it really boils down to friends, family, and fellowship, and that's what we had. And the next slide I think will show you the community that showed up the day that we did the recreation, and so we got a group picture. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that at this event, so that we'll be able to go back and look at it uh, as being at the uh, first annual uh, tractor school powers tractor school because i don't think it'll be the last one so we appreciate uh your time and attention uh yeah and who knows what's next we found this one on the internet too and i uh, thought well that might be kind of fun to recreate sometimes so <laughs> we'd really like to thank you guys for coming out and listening to our presentation hope we didn't bore you too much but next questions <laughs>